We're here today to have the conversation that we're going to have, which is about gun violence in Oakland uh, and how it's impacting community members, and also to talk about some solutions and um, what work is being done right now to address gun violence and what more can be done and should be done. So last year in Oakland, there were 485 firearm assaults, according to OPD. Right, so that's just the official number, almost 500 shootings in Oakland. Um, there were 102 killings, murders in Oakland. Um, that was the highest number that's been recorded in Oakland since 2012. All of you are deeply, deeply invested in violence prevention work in the community, but you don't come to that work as outsiders. You've all also been impacted directly by violence in some form or fashion, and you bring that personal experience into your work. So Reginae Jeffries was praised dancing for a friend. It had a candlelight visual. Uh, it was a dice game on 13th and Franklin. And she was uh, killed at the candlelight visual behind a $5 dice game. There was over a hundred and some people there that witnessed this here. And right now, to this day, five years later, we have not still received justice. This year, this really affected me. This was close to home. I haven't seen her grow up. That right there, that sparked it up. And I took a stand on a 90th and MacArthur, the 4th of July weekend. And I got a barbecue grill and I got some candy. And at the time, it was no like social media live. So I was doing videos, advocating the community and downloading them on Facebook and Instagram, just saying like, hey, if you lost your child, come bring me your picture. And we start supporting the loved ones like these families that had lost their kids to community gun violence. Um, to make a long story short, that year I lost four bloodline relatives and seven connections. My son had lost three, his cousin on his mom's side, and I lost four all together with seven. Uh, the last one was Melvin Johnson, um, my cousin that was killed on 88th and MacArthur and crashed in front of Casmo. That was at the end of December. And the whole thing is to support these families because when this here happens, two, three weeks after it happened, it get brushed on the rug. No one's coming up to follow on these families and see, hey, have you aged? Did you take a shower? Did you even brush your teeth? You know what I'm saying? Do you need something? You know what I mean? Um, and that's what we started doing start supporting them, coordinating funerals, fundraising, candlelight visuals to make sure they safe so this won't occur again. We are victim led. These are mothers, fathers, sisters and brothers, husbands and wives that lost their family, their loved ones, community gun violence. And we all come together under the umbrella of Stop Killing Our Kids movement. This is my son. His name is Simba Rache Sherry. Uh, most folks called him Rache. This is my grandson, Rache Ali, and that's me. And um, my son was killed in 2019 in SoCal, in Southern California, in Compton. And um, my son moved away from this area because he had problems trying to find housing and a job. So uh, he was formerly incarcerated and uh, he had a lot of love for, though for kids in the community. My son has uh, five children and one bonus uh, son and he took a lot of time with children and kids in the neighborhood and looked out for folks. I didn't receive any justice around it but folks here want revenge and my thing was that revenge will not bring him back and revenge will cause some other mother to cry and to do to be in in pain and I didn't want to see that. I live uh, about two blocks from where we are right now in the thir I've been there almost 34 years. I've seen 35 folks die on my block. 35, including children. We see conditions in the community financially deteriorating, people wanting to get money whatever way they can, folks who are hurting, hurting to hurt people. So hurt people are hurting people, so this cycle is continuing. And also that the fact that what we see is happening here that this community has been financially operating on a deficit as long as I've been here. You know, East Oakland doesn't get money. If you live in Montclair and Piedmont, you get, you, you get money, you get resources. 
but folks here, we don't have the parks, the recreation, we don't have the, the resources for, for affordable housing. None of that is here. So my thing is that I'm gonna keep working whatever way I can to make sure that it makes a difference for the children here, for the community here, and that I see you. And sometimes people don't think we see them. I see you and I love you. And that love, we need to show that love by how we treat people, how we talk to people, all of that, that's so important. At the time that our son was killed, he had made a friend with a young man who lived across the street. One day, he and three other friends were standing on the corner of the block that we live in, just talking. A, ro a jeep rolled up on them. And two guys came out of that jeep and accused the two of the friends that were standing there with my son for stealing their big toys. We later found out the big toys were big guns, AK-47. They accused these two other gentlemen that uh, they stole their guns. And they said, no, we did not steal your guns. We don't know anything about what you're talking about. They did not believe them. They started to shoot them with AK-47. My son and another friend were able to escape, run away. They killed this, uh, they shot these two people. One of them died on the spot. The other one later was transferred to the hospital. Later on, when these young men were in prison, they were able to communicate with their boys on the streets to make sure there are no witnesses. Our son had to move out of town. He had to get out of Oakland. And, yeah. yeah, it was in uh, police witness protection. He left, he went to Los Angeles. He came back to town because he heard that they were going to arraign the people who killed his best friend. I guess it's from there that they followed him. And the next day, they caught up with him. He was sitting in the car, uh, driver's uh, side. This gentleman came from nowhere with a AK-47 and started shooting my son. He didn't even give him a chance because he was sitting in the car. He just mowed him down. Later on, the police told us that they knew the car, the Jeep that they brought to do that job, and they knew who owned that car. However, they could not placed the owner of the car at the mother's scene. It was very painful, very, very painful. Lots of witnesses. And there were a lot of witnesses. However, we still haven't gotten any resolution up to today. I came into working in the criminal justice field and social justice field because I felt like this was very senseless. I'm from another country. I'm not used to seeing guns around. But over here, we tolerate ownership of weapons. I mean, we're talking about neighbors. Who are we afraid of? Am I afraid of my neighbor? We are Americans. We are citizens. Why should we be carrying weapons all over the place if there are not guns in the hands of people? some of these things won't be happening. But when there are guns all over the place, you're gonna to continue to see death on our streets. Before our son was killed, we were involved in um, Oakland community organizations. We were leaders in that organization in a, um, with, at, at our church, St. Andrew's St. Joseph Catholic Church. And we were members of what was called the West Oakland Cluster Local Organizing Committee of OCO. And um, the issues we worked on were violence prevention issues because we were in, Los in West Oakland where 
you know, there were lots of, there's lots of gun violence. So we started working on trying to uh, make things happen there for the better. We had actions with mayors and city council folks and everybody. We had lights put up and all that kind of stuff, but we had to work on, on, um, you know, on come at it at a, at a different level. You know, like try to find out root causes. Why are people behaving the way they do? How can we stop them from doing the things that they're doing? Or how can we support them in getting out of the lifestyles and all this kind of stuff? So we, my husband and I, along with Miss Sherry and a whole bunch of other people have been working on these um, solutions for years. I started the first night walks in West Oakland. We started walking in the communities and then we started doing what we call the call-in, where the, uh, the young people, the formerly incarcerated folks, some, some of them were not formerly incarcerated. These are people who are, who are either um, involved in gun violence or at risk, at risk to uh, commit gun violence. And it's all data-driven people that the police know are doing these things and uh, probation and the police department are inviting them to a forum with law enforcement community resources and all that and we're teaching we're talking with them about um, you know what you're doing out there is you know it's not sustainable for you you're gonna eventually not live through it the majority of you will die and if you continue this, you know, this path that you have chosen. So we want to help you out of that lifestyle. And law enforcement would tell them and the DA's office, all of those would tell them, if you take what we're offering you today, where if you come back in front of us, we'll do whatever we can for you. But if you don't take it and you come back in front of us, you're arrested or whatever, we're gonna prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law. And then we would have resources afterwards. There were pastors and people giving testimony on all these kinds of things. And, and, then, um, and then we had resources. So, so we had case managers and what have you, and they would sit and talk with the young men after the law enforcement leaves the room so they can feel like they belonged, you know, that this is not all just penal. None of this actually is penal. What it is is the community trying to reach out to you. And so a lot of young men really were embracing this. They did a pilot program in West Oakland, was the first pilot of the call-ins. And they were out there telling their friends, you know, like, and asking the folks who were doing, who were offering them resources, which was uh, Department of Human Services at the time. They were telling them, their friends, look, man, we could get help, you know, we can, get out of the streets. And it was, it was kind of working. And then the pilot program ended and they started to do it in East Oakland. They did it one time and then it, it ended for several years. When they started it back up again, the reason the, um, the gun violence was a lot less before COVID happened, and it was, it was um, I can't, I'm not gonna quote any years because I don't remember the years but the numbers kept dropping because of the, strat the ceasefire strategy, because we were doing the night walks, we were doing the call-ins, all, all of this stuff was, was working. And then COVID happened and lots of things started happening. So now the gun violence is back up. You know, I'm just listening to everyone else speak, uh, made me re relive so many different elements of, of myself, which helped me develop who I am now in, in so many ways. Um, I'm, I'm born and raised out here in Oakland. If I'm not in East Oakland, that's because I was incarcerated. You know, I, I've experienced all forms of Oakland in the different dynamics. You know, I'm all, I'm all, about, I'm all about finding solutions, right? Like, not just recognizing what's happening, but what can we do to stop it and change it? My whole life since I was young, all I've really mainly dreamed about was I'm dying. 
in one form or fashion. If it's not something or somebody killing me, me dying from a free car, freeway accident, me killing myself to be like no one hearing me, I've always dreamed I'm going to die somehow. So it was just like a matter of time. I say that because the way I moved and lived was like, I, I'm, I'm doing what I can until that, that, till that moment happens. Um, you know, listen to, listening to you guys speak very, very articulate, very uh, involved, very informed. And most of the people that I know that is, that, is, that is connected within the community where I'm from, they have no idea about community policies, community politics. They don't, they're not involved in that fashion because that's not their life, right? Like, that's going to go over a lot of people's heads. Um, and it took me a long way, time myself to even care, to even start investing into wanting to know what that means. Even though I've had good influences in my life from time to time. Um, that just wasn't my life. Every, every year I lose people that I know. Every every year. Uh, you know, and it's crazy because we have the newspapers that drop with all the pictures of the people from the year before that died. And, 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 and it's crazy because like a ritual, you know what I mean? It's like, well, let's see how many people we know this year. How do we connect to where we all say, don't do nothing to them because I know them, they're my people. That's my neighbor, we good, we click together, we go do stuff together. How do we make sure that we are all supportive in, 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 in all one big circle? So, you know, we began as a VPC and Brother Darrell was one of the founders as well with Adamika and the develop we was bringing grassroots organizations to the table to say, this is a, the start to where we can start branching out to community members to bring them to the table just so we can say we're all one. Because even if we have guns, even if we strap, that doesn't mean we have to use them. Because a lot of us to strap, like, I, you know, I, I can't even deny myself, like, I got a gun. But at the end of the day, that's because I'm, I'm, I still dream I'm dying. I'm, it's supposed to happen. It, it happens in front of my house. My my daughter still, you know, wakes up crying because she didn't, her guns in front of the house. It it's, it it happens every day. Um, but I still know that there's a solution. Not necessarily to say taking away the guns is the solution because you have communities that have guns that don't use them. Um, but it's just to say, how do we get everybody to have that mind state of? That doesn't have to be the first response in order to, to resolve our altercation. So a lot of what I do now is, you know, uh, advocate into trying to implement certain policies and different things in order to try to steer our focus into that same model, right? Like beyond just saying we have a department, we have to adopt that the council has to adopt those 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 budgets don't just say we're going to give you a budget. you got to adopt the budget to where is now it's mandatory you know currently a lot of things come out and it's like oh you know what's the plan a lot of like, the thing is what's the plan but if you don't have an, a, an adopted budget to tell me what i have to work with i can't give you a plan we was created because even though there were a lot of strong efforts and things that were still going on that were decreasing. We looked at it like any life lost was too many lives lost. We, we got to advocate. We got to stand up and speak out that, it, it, you know, we're not working to this, to this solution of us rec recognizing we're all one body. You know what I'm saying? When every, every time I lose one of my brothers and sisters, I lost a part of myself. I'm deeper in the hole of I'm next. On the one hand, it seems like there's internal work that that people need to do and that like the community needs to do, right? And there's also just, there's, there's work that needs to be done with external kind of forces, you know, money, resources needed to support programs. You know, you spoke about the ceasefire program 
um, and funding for that and the violence Oakland Violence Prevention Coalition like needing a dedicated budget to, you know to to actually define that work right if you could identify the biggest challenge right now in your work to try to address gun violence in Oakland what would that challenge be and then just what is what do you see this working I can't go to Booker Stowe to Harry's I can't go to no hot spot in East Oakland and say hey nephew Stop killing the kids. Hey, niece, stop selling your body if I don't have nothing to offer. Now, behind this money, I need a resource. I need someone to take them safely so they can start doing what they need to do in their life. But we got to fight over crumbs. 7500 for a grant. Are you serious? Are you talking about us for one year? I started off my organization. We got our first money for Economic Foundation, $5,000 grant to do some events. That was cool because shit, we was hustling, standing in church line getting foods to, to make our little gumbo and just to feed our community, right? Or uh, uh, twisting, robbing Peter to pay Paul and taking money out of our own, which we don't have, <laughs> to do for our people. You know what I mean? Um, that's one of the biggest challenges, man. They, we have to wrestle over crumbs and then they don't even give us enough of the pie so we can get enough of the crumb. It's money, man money and resources, but with the money we can get the right resources. And then us working together as a community, especially like the ones on the front line. We got over like, shit, what, 200 some nonprofits in Oakland and organizations, and half of them either going against each other because we fight behind the same money, or something went bad and we don't like each other, or whatever it is, we can't work together. But we all for the same cause. How do we help folks in a way that makes them healthy, how do we transform and deal with the trauma that's happening every day in this community? And I think we have the ability to address that. And we also have the ability to talk to folks about why they don't need to use guns, why they need to use their voice, and that we hear your voice. So those are important. And we need to empower our communities to do the, to, to, to uh, make these changes, to get this gentleman the money he needs to do the program he's doing, and to get behind him on those things. There's so many small community-based organizations that are not working together. What if we all work together? The city, the county, they didn't work together. When we started working on Lifelines to Healing and tried to start putting together some strategies around, around um, gun violence and all that, they were not, we couldn't get meetings with them together. They, one, one organization didn't know what the other one was doing. We need to come together so we can learn from one another. We need to give our children proper education, civic education in particular, for them to know the impact of their actions on the larger community. However, as we have all been saying, we have to have resources to make it happen. Community, the government, families, we all have to work together, like everybody's been saying, in order to make sure that we move forward as a community, as a society. We're going to have to keep on working on it. It's getting out of hand. It's really getting, it's not only in the Bay Area that we've seen upsurge of uh, violence all over the country, all over the country. So when is it going to stop? And we cannot police ourselves out of the violence situation. More police will not resolve this problem. We cannot resolve it through policing. We have to resolve it through working with the community and making sure that those resources are added back. There's never going to be enough time to really talk about everything that needs to be said, but I want to extend my appreciation to all of you for starting this conversation, and hopefully it's the beginning of more conversations that we can have together. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.